Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Okay, now great interview, Chael Sonnen. Chael P. Sonnen, one of the most interesting, and like I said earlier, I think one of the most intelligent guys and, and like I said, not even, I don't know how smart the guy is. I know he's intelligent, but like uh, the guy just really made the most out of his, out of his fighting ability. And geez, the dude talked to himself in like three title fights. How is it, has anybody else ever been able to do that? No. Well, you know, well, first off, this interview came together from Diamond Sportsbook, uh, betdsi.eu. Thank you. They're the ones that helped us out with this, uh, putting this together. And um, you know, Chris, like we can hear, we've got under 200 subscribers on our YouTube. Okay. Like Chael Sonnen, there's no reason, like we get the views, we get tons of views, but we need subscribers. So if you guys, if you guys like our content, like, share, subscribe, it, it honestly, it really helps us out. Yeah. And for Chael Sonnen to come on a podcast when he's getting 250, 300,000 views, every single segment he does. Um, is quite an honor. And the respect that came out in regards to yourself, Chris and Miguel, absolutely shined. And I, I think um, sometimes the unsung heroes are the people signing contracts and handing them out to fighters. And Shell made that perfectly known with Miguel, which, I mean, that's, that's kind of why we're all here. I mean, Miguel and Chris and myself, we all know each other, but we've never done anything all together at, at, at one time. And, um, you know, to see somebody that really benefited from both of you two um, in your help was was fantastic. Yeah, you know what I, I like the I like obviously catching up with Joe was really cool. I haven't you know been around him in about fifteen years probably, and he has changed. And but I do feel like that we got beyond that persona that he yeah. gave us. He gave us a you know a little bit of a human touch, an honest answer, uh, and a couple of opportunities where where. It could have gone the other way. I think. I think he we he broke through and and really talked shop with us, which he knows our bread. But he knows that's what we want to do. But for someone like him, I think you got to weigh everything you say. You know, I, I, you know everything he says is is going to be a soundbite. And uh, I think he gave us a lot of good stuff in terms of his relationships with Team Quest and a lot of stuff on on his coming up and the way he came up too. And uh, Mike, I guess you won the bet. You know. I thought Chill might have gotten beat up at some point as a kid because he's he could be a little bit arrogant that way, but no, no street fights. Well, no. well I think the most shocking thing was how we talked about his relationship with Matt Lindland and Randy Couture and how they weren't gonna help him at all. And you know, sometimes that's kind of like the Ducky. big brother, it's like the big brother syndrome. It's well, no, you're not as good as us, so we're not gonna help you out. And it yeah, sounds there to help us, you know. It, 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 I'll tell you <laughs> what, like the, the, the guy did everything he had to do in order to be a success on his own. Yeah, he did it on his own. Yeah, you know, it, it, what, one thing that shocked me was when he started to, his first fight was before mine. I had no idea that I don't be fighting before me. I thought he was after me, you know, but the guy started in late 1997. I didn't start training until 1998. So he was even before me. And then they just having a lot of the stories, like I always assumed. He was out there with Couture and Team Quest, and they had things, you know, rocking from the beginning. No, they didn't even know how to spar. You know, I, I, that kind of blew my mind. You know, I mean, yeah. I talked about me having one boxing glove and my partner having one. He said they didn't have any. They didn't even spar at all. So I was like, that really surprised me that, you know, he had the exact same stories as I did. I always assumed they had it really going on properly because they had Team Quest, but that wasn't the case. And, and you know, if, if I'm going to give credit where credit's due, like <laughs> – I put a lot of time and effort into the research and it's, it's, it's OCD. And there's a forum poster on the underground forum in Crowbar. He really came through for us. Chris, that's the guy I've been telling you about. He really oh, yeah. came, came through with us in order to uh, kind of help us piece together the little tiny details in regards to Chell's career. And man, shout out to you, Crowbar. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, Crobo. I really appreciate it. I mean, hey, it's one of the 200 listeners we have. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that, is, that is really cool because, you know, at the end of the day, it kind of tells us that Crowbar guy is one of us at some point. You know, yes, I mean, he, was, he, was getting, he, was, he was waiting for videotapes in the 90s, I think. Yep. 
for sure. Well, so well, without well, further ado, Chris, I mean, it's, it that's it. Yeah, without further ado, we got a great interview for you with JLP Sona. Check it out. Okay, everybody, lights out. Fans, podcast members, thank you for listening. We have a special guest today. And you know what we like to do, the deep dives. We go in deep and we get in the minds of these fighters, especially some of the old school guys. I have an old school guy right now. Um, I'm sure you know who this is, one of the most famous guys in the sport. And I got to be honest, in my opinion, probably one of the smartest. Now, I don't know IQ-wise. That's not what I'm talking about. But this guy has been able to do more. Um, groundbreaking stuff, uh, maximize his ability to make great fights, make big fights, I should say. And that that's not any way taken away from his ability, but man, the dude, he was a phenomenal fighter, but the dude had an ability to just sell himself better than anybody had ever seen at the time, change the game, in my opinion. This guy's a gangster from Oregon. Uh, TLP Stone, how you doing, brother? Never better, still famous and still rich. Thank you for asking. What's up, dude? <laughs> What I wanted to hear, my man, what I wanted to hear. So real quick, man, um, and, and I, I remember once I was listening to something you were talking about, Joe Rogan. You were like, Joe, what are you doing? You do not pull back the curtain and show the man behind the curtain. Don't do that stuff. But I got to ask you, my first time met, meeting you was when you fought Alex Diebling. And, 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 you know, that was in WEC. You had a very different persona then. And then I see you later, I'm like, isn't the same guy, but it worked. It was a method. Now, like I said, we can, we'll totally cut this if you want, because uh, if you don't want to talk about it, but like what went on to make you change the way you approached the game? Because it worked, brother. I mean, what it, was it a conscious system? Did things just kind of happen? Or was it a consciously thought out, I got to do this different to make what I, my money? Chris, I appreciate you bringing up uh, the WEC. I had great, such great memories. That's when we were still out. Remember the like the dirt field we we're fighting out. Lamore, Lamore. Yes, <laughs> yes. And Alex was a great guy. I actually trained with him. He came out to Team Quest. He was doing fights in Pride. And at any rate, I, I have good memories. I mean, at one hand, that seems like a lifetime ago. It also seems like yesterday. So uh, let's see. I will tell the way that I believe that it happened. Well, I felt like the camera found me. I never really felt like I changed my persona. I just didn't have anybody to say it to. I, I mean, I remember being in college, we'd have a dual meet and you'd have wrestling, but I'd have 80, 100 people in total in the crowd. I worked so hard for those 80 or 100 people, as did all my teammates and the competitors, but just nobody came to watch us. And I remember one time I was doing an interview with the local paper and we had Iowa. Number one ranked team in the country. Dan Gables, Iowa, was coming to town, and I gave him a great promo, and I was telling everybody why they needed to do it. I remember the, uh, the reporter of our, our small town, he turned the recorder off, thanked me for my time, didn't print a word of it, and went and <laughs> interviewed other people, and he never spoke to me again. And the coach even called me and said, hey, we got this call from uh, you know the register guard, and they, they, they said that you were saying this about Iowa. I'm like, guys, just run it. It's, it's going to work. And I could never get any attention. And I'd even happen in MMA. You might remember Loretta Hunt, who I'm very good friends with. This is not a slide on Loretta. But Loretta was a big deal in the world of SureDog.com at the time. And I did an interview with her after I fought for Miguel. Miguel put on a USA versus Russia fight at the Taj Mahal. So we're all out there doing that. And that's where I met Loretta. She called me and I, I did my interview. And I was a 205 pounder back then. And every question she asked me, I would find a way to steer it back to Chuck Liddell and why Chuck Liddell sucked. Now, <laughs> Chuck was the light heavyweight champion. He was the biggest star in the sport. I was not putting Chuck down. I was attempting to attach my lowly name to his big name. She sure. did not get it. And at one point she stopped the interview. She said, you are not who I thought you were. When I met you for a gentleman, I never would have called you if I knew you were this way. She never printed a word of it. And so, Chris, I had the hardest time running that okay. stick and getting people to even print it, let alone get it. I had athletic commissions. There used to be a guy in charge of Nevada a crook called Kaiser. And before <laughs> Kaiser got fired, he refused to license me one time and stated my poor sportsmanship as a model to kids because of how much trash I talked. And I remember just sitting there going, I don't understand what's happening, you know, but I never broke for him. I never go, no guys, Hey, it's I, I'm performing. No, I never did it. I waited till they found out. And when they did, it finally worked, but I was alone for a while, man. I, I wouldn't get help from anybody. They, they could, none of them could stand me. No, you know, you know, what's funny Till, to me when I heard you have a way of talking trash in almost in a way, like a gentleman, you know what I mean? And it's not, 
it's not like when a Diaz does it, oh, you know, uh, you know, it's not like fuck you. It, 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 you don't cuss. You're very respectful in a way. It, it's it's weird. It's very odd and, and respectful. You're like a gentleman, almost like you're from England, talk, like Canada talking. <laughs> it's it's a, it's beautiful the way it's done, and I, I think it's worked beautifully. Um, you know, some of my favorites. I got to be honest with you. I had this thing. Uh, an hour of epicness was all Chael Sonnen and. I'd play it for many people, you know, and we'd be on the way to a fight. So like, just listen to this stuff. It'd be a whole hour. You you know, when you're talking about the Nogueira brothers and the, in the bus, oh, that was so funny. But I mean, you did it beautifully. And I, I, I don't think you get enough credit for what you did. I appreciate you saying that. And I will tell you, you know, I had my own code. I, I never shot down. I never picked on anybody that was, you know, underneath me on the card or something. It was always firing up. Those were the guys that got their feelings hurt the most. <laughs> I thought those guys could take it. Like some of them were champions and had belts and they're making a whole bunch of money. Like I just thought that they could take it. They looked at all as disrespectful and uh, <laughs> yeah, man, it was, it, it was tough. And then whatever I said about anybody, I would show up on fight night, whether I felt like it or not, I have never missed a fight for any reason reason injury illness if i said it i will answer for it that was my code and if i followed that code i thought there was an honor in it and for eventually people got to where they enjoyed it now you know it's being copied today and we're kind of in the entertainment area which yeah. i do take credit for i do believe that i started that you um, did great. but for so, a while man yeah i was all alone i will tell you i go i go back behind the curtain i had to sit over here by myself while all the boys were over here you know i i had nobody but i stuck with it chris I, I appreciate it the whole time. So go ahead. All right. So chill May 10th, 1997. It's the first recorded fight that I could find of yours. It's the battle of, of Fort Vancouver against Ben Haley. Yep. When you pulled up to the venue that day, did you know that for the rest of your life, like this is a sport that you were going to attach yourself to? Yes, I knew this is exactly what I wanted to do. My father was a wrestler, but my father thought the toughest guys in the world were boxers. And this is before 1993 when they set that octagon up. You know, we're all left to guess. Was it karate or is it kung fu? None of us knew. I came from a wrestling family. My father was a great wrestler, my uncles, all my cousins. But we thought boxers were tougher than we were. So there was always that debate. Who's the best in the world? Is it the Olympic champion in wrestling or is it the, the Mike Tyson, the boxing champion? So when 1993 came and we found out, oh, wow, wrestling is actually a skill that could work in combat. We then added Muay Thai and we were trying to find jujitsu. It was very hard at the time. In fact, there was only six Gracie certified gyms in America at that time. So I found one of them under a guy named Pedro Sauer. It was in Provo, Utah. And um, at any rate, I saw, you know, I was getting the workouts in that I could. So when I finally found out about that fight and that fight was called pancreation, like when you talk about pulling up to the venue that day, I did not know what I was getting into. I was a sophomore in college, maybe even a freshman. I drove home. I stopped by my parents' house to get my stuff. I told them what I was doing. My mom jumped in the car. She went with me. My dad didn't. <laughs> And my dad was so upset. Like we brought him home the tape and that's back. You put the tape record on your camera and there's a VHS. And my mom came home and played the tape. He had all his buddies come over and he was showing everybody. He was so proud of it, but he didn't know what pancreas meant. And I didn't fully know either. They said, Hey, you're doing a pancreas fight. I didn't know what pancreas really meant. So we got there and there was no gloves. You had to wear shin pads. I mean, it was just an all out, it was an all out fight, but we didn't know at the time really what we were getting into. Eventually they called my name and we walked to the ring. Hey, let me, let me ask you, and before, how you doing, Joe? But, uh, What's up, Miguel? but before that, we usually ask people to say, you don't seem like it. I would have been against it. You're not the street fighter since you were a kid kind of person, are you? No. No, I didn't like this. I mean, I don't like that stuff now. Those things come up. But no, I don't have any like uh, those brave stories of the of the street fights or anything like that. I don't like this. I still don't like when guys do it. I don't know when two <laughs> armed combatants don't wait for the agreed upon time and place. It bothers me. I don't think that stuff's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, very interesting. Go, Mike. I, yeah, I'm not fighting for free either. There's, I'm never yeah. fighting for free. That ain't going to happen. Oh. You have a, a two year layoff. Um, from that fight, and so your next recorded fight, but I believe you fought a smoker against Trevor Pranglin. Well, so a smoker, the term that I think of when smoker is purely boxing, I, I fought Trevor Prangley. It was an MMA fight, and yes. we had fought, and I have an excuse, so I'm giving you my excuse, but this is just what happened. Trevor and I fought, seven-minute fight. It was one seven-minute round. You're in, you're out of there. Uh, 
at seven and a half minutes in, he triangled me. Seven minutes and 31 seconds, he triangled me. A technique I'd never seen before. Very tricky technique. Now it would be very basic, but we'd never heard of this in 1997 or 98, <laughs> whatever this was. So he catches me in a triangle and I tap out. And the promoter said, yes, I know time was up, but I enjoyed the match so much, I let it keep going. And we didn't argue. Like, that made sense. Back in that time with no commit, I was there with my father. We didn't argue at all. Go, oh, is that why it was longer than that? And we just walked out the door. That was it. We didn't complain. I mean, now that sounds silly, but back then, man, it was kind of normal. Uh, that it's is like the Wild West. Um, did, okay, so I, I, I found the footage. Uh, JT Taylor has it posted on YouTube. Is that you? Are you the... Are you the hometown guy in that fight, or was Trevor? Because he uh, had a loud pop. Well, we fought in Portland, so I get, th that would make me home. Trevor is actually <laughs> from South Africa, but was living in Idaho. He wrestled for North Idaho Community College. So I, I suppose you would consider me. I don't know if either one of us had any fans there, but I would have been closer to home than Trevor. Okay. So did who, you have any of the fights in that period, or was that it? No, so I fought, I think Prangley was the first fight I ever have. If I have that wrong, then it was Ben Haley. But, um, and then there was a, I was in college. So I was just going to school. I was wrestling and had a scholarship. I didn't graduate till 2001. So those right. couple of matches I had were, you know, I kind of had to slip off to do them and then slip back and not tell anyone type thing. So in 2002, man, you, you, you hear the term baptism by fire and it doesn't really mean anything to you until you see it like in person and you, you fly out to California, which a flight on your first real fight is, is a big deal. Sure. And you fight on Hitman fight promotions against Jason Mayhem Miller. And when you guys watch this video, you see like when you watch the totality of Chell's career, you see him leveling up at this point, the jujitsu defense of Mayhem Miller completely nullified any offense that Chael had. I think the only thing that you had in that fight was a double leg takedown. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, and I'll tell you this, my big takeaway from that fight. So it was called a uh, Hitman fighting championships, Paul Herrera and Tito Ortiz teamed up and they put it on at a, a casino. And I'm trying escaping what one Barboza. <laughs> Is there something called like Barboza or Baboza, Babobo? At any rate, we go to this casino and I took mayhem down in a double leg. And Mayhem disappears. You can't see him anymore. My mom's in the front row and she can no longer see Mayhem. Well, the cage had broken. And the cage, <laughs> the canvas that like the crowd sees is just plywood. So it breaks and it gives way and Mayhem's now in this hole. So they stop the fight. They get Mayhem out of it. They try to fix it, but they don't have any tools. They were not at all prepared for this, this cage to break. Dana was in the crowd. I mean, this like at the time, as small as it was, this, it was a pretty big show. So. I don't know where the hole was. I don't even know what happened. You know, I'm fighting. It's my first pro fight. I'm exhausted. All these different things. So they send me to my corner. My corner is Dan Henderson and Randy Couture. So we're in the corner and Paul Herrera is the promoter. And he comes in after a few minutes of trying to fix this. And he yells, he yells to me, we couldn't fix it. So don't go in that area. And they just like pulled the canvas type to make the hole go away. Well, I don't know where that area even was. <laughs> I don't know where we, and I'm totally turned around. I've never been in this kind of environment. I'm literally fight, you know, it's a fight. And I remember the whole night trying not to step in that. And by the way, there was a tournament going on. Mayhem and I filled in to like give a break for the tournament. They had three more matches after us and they all fought. And, and he, Paul Herrera told them all the same, don't go in that part of the ring. It's broken. And no one did. It was just like the promoter added a minute and a half to my fight. Like that's the way it was back then. I love old school. Hey, right. let me ask you. Is that, I love it too, Chris. Is, is that Paul Herrera, uh, Tank's old sidekick? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Very Tank interesting. is yeah. the first guy I ever trained with, by the way, Miguel. 1995, I was going to BYU to college. Mark Schultz was the head coach, and Tank came out to train with Schultz. So here we are at this religious school, <laughs> and we got Tank Abbott in the room. And, you know, Tank, I don't know if you've ever seen him, he could put up over 600 pounds. So he would go in the weight room. All the football players would stand around. He'd, he'd rep out like 625. It was just amazing. And Tank, as rough of a personality as he has publicly, he was the nicest guy. I have nothing but great memories of, of Tank Abbott. He was the nicest man to be around, believe it or not.
I so, so, so you say you start training. How did the transition go to start training with Randy Couture, Team Quest? How, how did you get hooked up with those guys? Okay, so in the year 2000, Dan and Randy were workout partners. Dan moved out, and they were trying to make the Olympic team in Greco. I was also trying to make the team, but I was at a college. So I would do the college workout, and then I would drive two hours and work out with them and drive every single day I would do this. And wow. after the Olympic trials, I just kept going to practice every day at three o'clock. And one day I came in and they weren't wearing shoes and they threw me a pair of gloves and said, we're doing this instead. And so for me, I just put the gloves on. Like those were the guys I looked up to. This is what I do every day at three. It was a very, uh, it was very normal. It wasn't, it wasn't strange at all. I had to get a mouthpiece and stuff like that, but <laughs> that, I just kept going to practice at three o'clock. So, so Chael, when you took that fight against Mayhem Miller, it's your first real fight, and he's listed as 5-0. and oh. Did you do any homework in regards to that, or did you just show up and they made a locker room bout while you were there? No, they. I had a video. Uh, the day before the fight, Paul Herrera actually had a video of a tournament that Mayhem had won. And I want to say it was a four-man tournament, but it might have been eight. I might have had – I at least saw two fights of his. I might have seen three. And, you know, the, cir the circle was pretty small. I heard about Mayhem. Everybody <laughs> said he was really good. He had a brown belt in jujitsu at the time, but a brown belt was rare. It was, it was rare wow. to meet a guy with as high as a brown belt back then. You almost meet no black. I didn't know any black belts. So, but that was it. And I thought he looked pretty damn good on the video. Like I saw it the night before. And I remember laying in bed that night thinking about the fight. I thought <laughs> it was, was going to be a hard match. Wow. Wow. So you go on to August 24, 2002, UFCF. So, regionally speaking, you obviously have your ticket sellers. And there was a guy out of Desert Dogs who was a huge ticket seller named Justin Hawes. Going into that fight, was there a big buildup between the two of you? Yeah, so we fought in a, uh, again, this was a casino. Matt Hume was the promoter. And it was limited seats, like a 1,000 people, but it always sold out. Even before I was fighting on it, I would always drive when it happened, once or twice a year. And so it was a packed place and we weren't like the feature match. I, there were 10 matches. We were sixth on the card, but we were both kind of the local guys and local tough guys kind of building our own reputation. So I had never met Justin before that, but I knew his name. He was in the area and he was winning some fights. So I don't know if there was a huge promotion, but for my little circle of friends that drove up in the car with me, you know, it, it was a big deal for us. For sure. I was about to ask you, did you drive up because, from Oregon to, to Washington, there is not too far, huh? So, yeah, so, yeah so I got to fight in Washington a couple of times. Even for you, Miguel, when we fought in Vancouver, Canada, I, I think I even drove to that with my uncle and my aunt. It was about a six hour drive, but it Ooh. turns into a family thing. You know, everybody's in the car and you stop off and you look at this or you eat something over here. Some of my best memories were just getting to and from the fights. It wasn't the fights themselves. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> let me ask you, was the, the Couture and the. Uh... Lindland head up, head up to uh, Washington with you as your cornerman too in the car. All you guys in the car together. Lindland, well, I'll tell you Lindland's story because it is a Bodog story. But when we fought in Canada, I don't know if you how much you remember that, but I fought Alexi Olnick on that card for you at 185 pounds. Now Olnick's a successful heavyweight, but at that time, <laughs> super fighter at 185. So Miguel, something happened in the back that night, and I'm getting warmed up, and I can't find Lindlin. He was my corner man, but he's he's gone, and I only have one corner man. This isn't when you have two or three. I just have Matt, so it's Matt's job to wrap my hands and anything that you would do. But it's Matt's job. I don't know where he is, so I head to the ring by myself. Now he appears in the ring. I see him in the ring. And after the fight, we get in the back and I'm telling him, oh, my goodness, my hands hurt so bad. I'm taking the gloves off. And he goes, well, you didn't wrap your hands. And I go, yeah, I don't know where you went, Matt. I haven't seen you for two hours. And he goes, well, why don't you wrap your hands? He starts yelling at me. I go, Matt, because you disappeared for two hours. Like I'm doing me shaking my hands was my passive aggressive way of telling him how bad he failed me. He's not getting it. And he's yelling at me for how irresponsible it was that I didn't wrap my hands before a fight. How are you supposed to wrap them by yourself? Right. Oh, I got two hands. One of them's been used. Tape. I don't even know how to wrap a hand. I've never wrapped my own or someone. Right. I put Matt wraps my hands. He was gone. I don't know where he was. Still to this day, I don't know where Matt went. So, Chael, other than uh, we always talk about a, a promoter from Minnesota named Brad Kohler, who has got some historic stories in regards to just. They're not just good. You no, know, just deceiving fighters, undermining athletic commissions. And a close second, who we have not addressed yet, 
is actually Dan Severn as a promoter. <laughs> and you fought for Danger Zone 13 in a four-man tournament. And you fought Jesse Alt. Oh, here. First off, what were your feelings going into a tournament at this point in your career? Okay, so I was so excited for one reason. They had a belt. If you won this tournament, you won a belt. <laughs> so, you know, I'm make-believe UFC fighter that time. I don't know the difference. A belt's a belt. And my father was a rodeo guy. And if he rode well in the rodeo, you could win a buckle. So in my dad's younger day, he wore a buckle and he wore that buckle every day, but he had won it. He earned that buckle. He was proud of it. So now I get to get my belt. So I got to fight two guys, but I get to get a belt. So I get to the hotel, we check in and I go to the hotel with my opening round draw. We're in the same room. Severn puts us in the same room, right? So you got queen beds. His name was Scott Shipman. Perfectly nice guy, but that's awkward. I mean, that's just weird. No matter how much we want to act like it's not. Uh... So I told Scott, I go, hey, man, great meeting you. I'll be right back. And I took my bet. He knew I wasn't coming back. So I go <laughs> to the front desk with my own credit card. I mean, I don't see Scott until we're fighting for this belt. And Dan's been nothing but a gentleman to me. But I will tell I got one negative Dan story, which was when this whole thing's done. And I do win the belt. When the whole thing's done, it was videoed. So I'm trying to buy the video. It was $20. You had to mail this thing in and send a check. So they cash my check, but they don't ever send me the video. And I oh. want it for my father. <laughs> The fight. So I send an email to Becky Levi. And I was like, Becky, I waited on this for two months. Can I please have the video? So then Dan gets involved and Dan demands that I send proof of payment, a copy of the front and the back of the. Now, this is a $20. I just thought it was rude. It's like, Dan, if I went to all this work to scam you out of a $20, just give me the video. First of all, yeah, what kind uh, of person? That's unbelievable that they charge you for a fight that you fought in, man. I mean, come on, dude. Fight. But, and, but then, Chris, he also accused me of lying, that I didn't <laughs> buy it and wanted me to provide proof. Like, I'm, I'm not going to a copy machine and then to the post. Like, I'm just not going to do it. Just keep it. I, I, got a, I got a couple of First of all, Monty used to do that where you'd fight and, and send them. Yeah, a, he did that to me once. Cop, I didn't buy the video. Some money for his DVD. But, uh, yeah, you, 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 that's a pretty amazing little story there, man. Yeah, so uh, go ahead, Mike. All right. So I, I just want to point out I, my question right here is, is there an actual belt that you got? Because I have a feeling there wasn't. Yes, the danger zone, but it was a beautiful belt. It's I was gonna ask, is that more than was it more than 20 bucks to belt? Yeah, it most definitely was. Yes, it most definitely was. And part of the contract was that if you ever lose the belt, you have to give the you know, you don't keep the belt, it then goes to the but they never held another show, or if they did, they never invited me. So I do still have the Danger Zone belt. The only, per and I'll tell you one that owes me a belt. I won the Gladiator uh, Challenge belt, and Gladiator Challenge and King of the Cage. At one point, I mean, these were like perennial shows, as small as yeah. they were for this country. They had Hook and Shoot and Gladiator Challenge and King of the Cage, and then you had the UFC. I mm -hmm. won the Gladiator Challenge belt. A hard fight. I beat a guy named Jason Lambert. And some guy named Ted, I can't think of Ted's last name, but Ted, it's, uh, Ted Williams, Ted Williams ran Glader Gladiator challenge. So after I win the belt, Chris Lieben, who is my teammate is going to fight in a championship match himself. So Chris, I was co-main and Chris was main. So Chris comes out, he wins. Ted comes in the back, informs me he's a belt short, takes my belt, puts it around Lieben. <laughs> Lieben never gives it back. Ted promised me he'd mail me a belt to this day. Like I have updated Ted for over 20 years going, Hey, you know, I really do want that belt. And I'm not joking when I, like, I really would like to have that. He's never sent it to me. And now he won't even respond to me. That was a scummy move. I earned that belt fair and square. If I want the belt, it's mine. It's my decision. We need but, to hit him up. We need to get on his uh, DM yeah. of some of this. This is some bullshit. So, so 20, Kale, 20 years, he never set the belt that he promised me. I earned it. So you, the one thing, and, and I've got the gladiator challenge. I've, I've got everything like psychotically documented. So Scott Shipman, your opponent, yep. he, Mark Coleman, obviously you've met him, you know him. Mark Coleman, it, it, before the UFC even existed, was attempting to build just a team of the world's baddest men without even understanding that the UFC was on the horizon. And Scott Shipman was one of those people. And he was certain, because I, I, I know Mark very well, that Scott Shipman was going to be a world class champion like he was going to be a, a champion of the world and after that fight it says you won by forearm choke but in actuality what mark and Wes Simpson told me is that you won by guillotine that loss 
changed him. Like he never fought again. And he never like, it's one thing getting knocked out. It's another thing getting choked out, but it forever changed him. And he never even showed up to the gym again after that fight. Oh my, I'll tell you this. Scott was scared of me. I could tell he was scared of me, but what Scott didn't know is I was scared of him. I was scared of him back. He was the roommate that I told you I took my bag and left and went sure. somewhere else. You only do that if you're scared. Right? I could, we sized up everybody. We knew we were going to see each other tomorrow. And um, I didn't know that he stopped. He was, uh, I was a wrestling fan and I watched him. He was eighth in the U S open the year before. So he was one of the guys kind of making his way through. I didn't know that fight had, had changed him. I thought he was a very tough guy. And um, that kind of makes me feel bad. I must tell you, I, I wish he would have stayed with it. I think he was a good athlete. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, Chris, let me just give just some basic questions here. You've got Trevor Prangley, who on paper at this time is 6-0, and Chel Sonnen, 5-0. and They live within about 90 minutes to two hours of each other. When they meet again with two fighters on the upside, in theory, where do you think you'd put the fight? Me? Um, yes. If I couldn't put it right in between the bring both fans, I'd probably try and do that. If there's no place okay. to put it, I'm putting it in somebody's backyard. Unfortunately, you're wrong. In XFA5, they put it in Florida against Trevor Prangley <laughs> as the main event with a whole fight card put together with one local person that's 5-21 and 21 on the card. Everybody else is, I mean, some of them might be training in the area, but nobody is local. Chael, did you think you were going to get paid when you walked into the venue that day when you saw the stands empty? Yes, I did. I will tell you, I'm from the country. And like, I mean, they'll hang a man out here if you lied. Everybody's word is good that I grew up around. I didn't know it was all to one another. I mean, I, truly, I did not know that. So we got out there. I want to say it was a promoter named Sean. And every deal that I had, he was a perfectly nice guy. But he was, to your point, Mike, planning to use the gate that night to pay everybody, which, of course, we didn't know. We're, we're not part of the business side of it. We, we're promised a thousand bucks and you come out and do this at this time and then you get paid your money well sean was counting on the gate that ended up being a little light dan lambert brought the whole att and if it wasn't for those 20 or 30 guys there was nobody there so yeah after that fight uh he stiffed us all and he but he called us a lot of times when a guy stiffs you he, he disappears or he changes his number sean was calling us all he's like hey i'm really sorry about this i'm gonna work it out and he did eventually he did something he robbed peter to pay for really him. somewhere along the way my check did come yeah it was late but it came well, that's, that's good but i mean my ed kim guy never he just disappeared and you never heard of him again he filed <laughs> bankruptcy so and you usually know that right away i mean it's like within the next day you can't find the guy chris this guy <laughs> shot around you know he was saying i screwed this up i thought i was going to get it from the gate but i'm going to do this and whatever but he did i got to give it to wow him. i want to say it was like sean thompson but uh he did it he made it right i got respect miguel and i had a bet we figured that dan lambert played super dan and just kind of covered the cost because there's no video of this there's nothing online in regards to where you can reference it i'm just looking at the fight card going oh he got murdered like there's just no way anybody was actually there and Dan did do that sometimes. Dan would come in and he would either cover costs or he would match it. If, if you were one of his guys and you won, he'd match your bonus. Dan helped a lot of people. He never really got credit for it. I think because oh, yeah. he had some money, people thought, oh, that's what he's supposed to do, man. There was no part of that that he was supposed to do. He was a good dude. He helped a lot of people. So from there, you go and fight in Pancras against Akihiro Gono, where you get a draw. And this is your first overseas <laughs> fight. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Would you mind walking us through like the process of getting the fight, going to Japan and, and entering the ring? Okay. So I was, I would stay up at night. I mean, I had a process. I got up in the morning and I did these things and practice was in the afternoon and then I had my, my own time, but I was very disciplined at this time. And it was 11 PM to 1 AM, but for two hours a day, every day, I would go on a computer and just look up different websites, try to find a contact, try to find promoters. And sometimes it worked. I did that right through the Abu Dhabi page. It's how I got in Abu Dhabi the first time. I mean, I, I used to do this until I could reach somebody. So I did that with Japan. And somehow I got in with somebody with Pancrase. The opponent was Gono. I do the fight with Gono, and it was two rounds. And I lost a point. I did a low blow and lost a point. So we end up with a draw. But to come back to, so Pancrase goes, okay, we like you. We'll do a few fight deal. You'll hear from us. 
Well, when I heard from them, it was via email, and the email was from a woman named Phyllis Lee. And Phyllis Lee said, I am the contact to Japan. You sign a contract with me, and basically I get 20% for the rest of your life. If you say yes, I will then get you in touch with Japan. If you don't, for, forget it, you're never coming. And I couldn't do it. I, I didn't know Phyllis, and it was a really big and inclusive contract, and, and I, I couldn't sign it. So, Chichelle, unfortunately, my at the beginning of my career, I signed with Phil because I've been fighting like uh, a couple months and uh, got me over to Japan. So yeah, sure. I, I was I was part of that deal. And like uh, Evan Tanner was with her at some point. I figure he was the one who got you in. He was he was going to Japan all the time when my first time over there. He was a big deal there. So, but yeah, the the contract wasn't good. You chose wisely. Sure. Yeah, no, it was it was one of those things. And Chris, I almost did. I mean, I was desperate and I really wasn't looking for money. I was looking for an opportunity. And I was yeah. like, well, if well, she can get me over, she can have her cut. I just want to compete. Well, that was me back in 1999. I mean, there wasn't much around, you know, so going over there was about as big of a deal. They treated you like a real athlete, unlike here, you know what I mean? So it was just, I had a guy, a couple of guys from my gym, like Jason Gotti was going over there. So when I found out, I could do it. I was like, 20%, no problem. I didn't even read the contract. I was like 23 or something. You know what I mean? So I was a young guy. And later on, I started realizing things weren't right. Like, she'd be like, they're not giving you a corner man, Chris. And she's like, they're bringing me over, though. So I didn't realize till later, like, she was taking my corner man plane ticket. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't just her being, not, they're not sending her a ticket. She's taking my ticket. You know, I realized yes. this stuff when I get older, but I didn't get it then, so. I met her one time. I was in a restaurant. She was a sweet old lady at that point. Yeah. But she was with Dan Severn and I want to say like Ron Waterman. She ran yeah. in that yep. crew. And, and uh, yeah, that's how I met Phyllis. And I told her, I said, you know, I actually got an email from you one time. At, uh, if I wanted to go to Pancrase, I, I, I got this email for the contract. And she said, yeah, that's that's who I am. I'm in with them and nobody gets <laughs> without going through me. She was very open about it. Yeah, Jim, you, know, you, fought, you fought on the Bodog card with uh, Waterman and Gracie at the top of it, yes. right? That's yeah, what I, 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 I dealt with Phyllis to get Waterman. <laughs> so let, let me come full circle on this. So Akira Gono, between the four of us, I think we probably either seen Ben Su in person about a thousand MMA fights. And Akihiro Gono, in, in my 26 years in combat sports, achieved something that I have never seen before. And that is on the pre-fight inspection, he looks like he's got defibrillator tabs on him. And the referee has to peel these things up. I have never seen anybody get caught by a referee with like a foreign substance on them outside the WWE. What was that? I, I remember, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I don't know, because that is what it looked like. Those little stickers, those fibrillator stickers, as you say. Like I he had a heart attack he before he got there. <laughs> there was a scam going around for the while for a while that if you put certain tapes on yourself, it, it, it would like iodize your body and help you with. Energy. I, don't, I don't know if it was part of that or what, but there there's been multiple tapes. It'll come out again, like 10 years from now, some other con man cycles. And you put this tape around your wrist and it cures cancer and people. Will buy it. <laughs> and I think that's, I thought that's what he did. He's like, put those weird stickers that he, he bought on an infomercial. That That's how I interpreted it. It was, uh, they were everywhere. They were on like the back of his legs. They were everywhere. It was strangest things I've ever seen. So we're going to chalk that up as gas pills. He bought some gas pills, mm -hmm. make his mileage go higher and uh, got to draw. But you know, if I may interject also, I, I think your biggest issue with Pancras, because you, you had a second bout there, was, do you know how like in soccer, you kind of barely touch somebody and they flop and they can't believe that, that, that you hit them so hard and they're trying wow. to get a foul? And they do it so often that the referees really don't, don't fall for it. Well, just the opposite was taking place in Pancrase. If you just graze somebody in the midsection, they would, they would claim, oh, he hit me in the groin. And it's an automatic point deduction. There's no like warning. There's no, hey, let's have a conversation about this. It's an automatic point deduction. And in both your fights in Pancrase, that happens to you. I will tell you this, and that is true what you said, as it pertains to me and Gono, I kicked him in the nuts. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I, the angle that I saw, which is like a gentle grace. <laughs> it wasn't on purpose. I mean, I was still learning to kick, you know. We used to have, and Chris, I don't, I trust you were fighting back then, but like you would do Monday, 
at the boxing gym and Tuesday in a wrestling gym. <laughs> Maybe you could find someone that knew some submission holds and that would be Wednesday or some variety of this. And then if you could find a fight, which was hard to do, you would then try to figure it out on Saturday, but there was no such thing as sparring. Like we didn't have headgear, the big gloves or a round system. That's just not part of it. So there was time. And like when I, when I hit him with a low blow, it was just a lack of experience. I'd practiced everything, but you know, not even sparring or so now I could spar. I would never hurt anybody or kick them there. But back then, then it was a crapshoot on Saturday. You know, you're trying, you're putting everything together as, as you see fit, but we, there wasn't actual sparring back then. No one had it. So I, I, I vividly remember, and this might've been when you fought Alex, but I remember when me and him would get together and train sometimes it'd be like, I get the right glove this time. You get the left glove. We had one pair of gloves and we trained with it sometimes. And, and mm -hmm. you couldn't throw both hands. It was just one. Sure. And I, I, that, that was the real thing. We actually did that for a while. Until we got two pair of gloves. So it was just why, like, I got the left one today. You know, that that was a real thing that happened a lot. And Chris, <laughs> you mentioned Evan Tanner earlier. Evan Tanner, when I met him, had already fought for the title. I want to say he oh, fought yeah. Tito, but he, or it was Tito or Frank, but he'd already fought for a title. And he told us that he had DVDs and magazines and a buddy. And they would go through the instructional or they would put a DVD and then they, they'd practice it on the living room floor. As silly as that sounds now, that's real. That's how we were <laughs> training too. Like that, that, that's what you did back then to try to get to the highest of levels, the best there was. Yep. So you mentioned Paul Herrera as a promoter and Tito Ortiz with Hitman Fight Promotions and our productions. And I will tell you, Chael, those two are not your friend at this point in your career. So you go back to Florida and they give you Baba Lou Sobral, who just he lost to Kevin Randleman and, and Chuck Liddell in the UFC. And it's his first fight on the independent scene since fighting at that level. And he's 20 and five. And they had you're six, one and one at this point, And that's the bout they put you in. Yep. <coughs> How well, difficult was that accepting that fight? Moreover, I was a 185 pounder. And so Babalu was at light heavyweight, but I had to do that early on. I preferred to go 85, but I would go up to light heavy wherever there was a chance. I mean, getting an opportunity was so hard, but you just have to beg. And uh, at any rate, so when Babalu came around, that was a big opportunity for me. I knew who he was. Babalu had come out to the Olympic Training Center. He was the, the representative for Brazil. Brazil on the freestyle scene. So I saw my really? he's got a very unique look, you know, he looks scary. He's got the scary eyes and the tattoo. So that was a big chance for me. And I didn't know how the fight was going to go, but I thought I can go take this guy down. I'd seen him work out and wrestle before. I thought he was talented, but I thought I was better. I thought I could get on top of him more than he could get on top of me. That was a weird fight though. We, they, so they said, I won that fight. If you're looking up the record. So they yes. said, I won. but there's a little bit more to it. That fight was a draw. So he and I agreed to fight for three rounds. And I went around and he wins around or vice versa, but he had won one and I had won one. So we're getting ready for the third and Paul Herrera gets in the ring and he goes, Hey, we're done. We're going to call it right here. And we're looking around going, what you're going to call. And I know the outcome. It's a draw. I clearly won one and I clearly lost. It's a draw. And Paul, yeah, we're going to call it. That, that's enough. So we come to the middle and the referee makes the announcement and says, I won. So they raised my hand and Babalu's always held that against me. It's like, Babalu, I don't, I know it was a draw, but he doesn't tell the story that way. He doesn't say it's a draw. He says he won. That's not true. He did not win. It was a round of peace. We, we were supposed to go to the third. We did it. They said I won. That was a championship fight. I've got that belt, too. <laughs> did, afterward, did they tell you why they just decided to stop? Yes. Uh, no, they never told us why they decided to stop, but... I'm close on this. Like this story's changed over time, but I'm close. So they did not have, uh, they did not have sanctioning at the time. And in California, you couldn't hold MMA. So Paul found a workaround, which was to hold an MMA event. And then when the attorney generals came in and said, what are you doing? Paul goes, oh, no, no, no. This isn't MMA. I'm filming a movie. And the attorney general goes, oh, that's right. This is just a movie set. And Paul said, yeah. And they go, well, if it's a movie set, then tell us right now who the winners are. And so Paul turned a list in of the winners the day before the contest. And like there, there is some truth to this because there was a guy that got knocked out. He was knocked and they had to wait like the real knockout, not just down and they call it. Not, he was out. They had to wake him up and the whole bit. He won. 
They raised that son of a bitch's hand. So there was for sure something <laughs> very weird about how this went. But yeah, Babalu's always held that against me. It's like, Babalu, I didn't do anything different than you did. I showed him to compete. <laughs> You know, hey, well, it shows that they thought you were going to win the fight, though. That's good. He thought I was good. There's a compliment in there somewhere. Yes, Paul <laughs> apparently thought I was going to beat Babalu. That's right. <laughs> so there's legendary tournaments that we talk about in in like in our podcast, and you had fought in one of them, the IFC September 6, 2003, the IFC fifty thousand dollar eight man tournament. And but- before we we go down that road, you got to look at the participants. You got Babalu, Trevor Prangley. Shogun Rua, Jeremy Horn, Mikha- Mikhail Abitsarian, um, oh. Forrest Griffin, and Tommy Trauma, Tommy Sauer. And there's only like one or two people that never made it to highest levels. And Tommy Sauer is kind of on the bubble right there. But it gets that legendary just uh, you know, credibility <laughs> based on the totality of the participants that went on to do big things. Um, what was your experience with them? Because I have a different take on what most people say, and I'll get to that after you're done. So Tom Sauer ended up pulling out of that tournament. They replaced him with a Russian fighter, and that Russian's last win was over Randy Couture. They fought in Japan, and the guy arm-locked him. So they call this the toughest – many people have said this, but they've said that's the toughest tournament that MMA has ever done. And it might have been. I mean, it was definitely – it was definitely hard, and it was one of those – Babalu was just there to win. You could see that look in his eye. It was in Colorado. He came out there a month early. He acclimated. Like, there was something kind of special around Babalu. We never crossed paths. I ended up with Forrest Griffin, who pulled that same trick move that Trevor Prangley once knew, called a triangle choke that nobody had ever <laughs> seen before. So I was done, but I watched that whole thing from the stands, and Babalu beat uh, Prangley. Babalu finished Born. Shogun. And Babalu dominated Horn in the finals. That was his 50 grand. So, wow. Legendary tournament. There's no doubt. This is, but, but people, all right, up until this point, you talked about a couple shit show, like a couple circuses that you were involved in. But the participants in this one make people ignore the circus that was with that event as well. So the promoter was Paul Smith. And Paul Smith is California guy buys a brand new cage, drives it up to Denver, Colorado, has never even set it up before. When they set it up, the difference in like the temperature and the the altitude, there's a huge bubble in the middle of the cage, like an eight foot long bubble because the boards warped because they didn't acclimate to it. So the state comes in and they go, wait a minute, this is no good. And they start to have it kind of going back and forth. Paul is kind of finagling his way. And in the middle of that, he says, wait a minute, these pipe runners, like the foam that goes underneath the cage walls, those are white. I don't like that color. So two hours before the event, he has a guy named Crowbar. He goes by Crowbar, spray paint them black. And when you look at the video, there's white blotches all along it. And the fighters, not yourself, are wearing the paints because it never it never dried. All right, <laughs> I love it. And this is the, the fifty thousand dollar tournament, and if you if you look at the IFC, they've had several instances where checks really didn't clear on time, and I was shocked that all of these people kind of went forward thinking that they'd get paid that fifty thousand. Sure. Hey, and it, that was tough too. I mean, again, that was where opportunity was. Everybody got twenty five hundred dollars to show up, and then of course fifty thousand to the winner. There was nothing for second. They're, they they weren't playing the thing to third. But the problem they ran into was if you win in the quarterfinals, why show up for the semifinals? And we all assumed because we were given twenty five hundred to show up for the first round, which was quarters, that that was also honored for the semis. That that was yeah. also honored for the finals. And it was right before. I mean, it's during the rules meeting. Like we're there, we wait in, we're getting ready to wrap hands. They have a quick rules meeting, and I think it was Prangley, but somebody brought that up and goes, "Hey, Paul, just to be this is twenty five per match, right? And then fifty thousand dollar bonus." And that's where Paul and no, it is not. It is twenty five <laughs> for the first one. You're not. So you could have three fights and get 2,500 bucks. You could have three fights and get 52,500 bucks. You could have one fight and get 2,500, but no, it was not accounted for. And guys started to, to chirp. They looked like they were going to back out of this thing 
So Paul started negotiating on the spot. Whatever he said, I, I don't know if that was ever honored. Again, I went out in the first round, so I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it was just a conflict. It was an accidental thing that they ran into that nobody thought of until right there in the game time moment, which sounds a lot like the spray paint. It sounds like nobody thought that one through. So, like, if you look at, like, the totality of that event in your broadcast booth, you got Ryan Bennett, you know, he, he passed. Big Papa Schnacki passed to Jens Pulver. And the ring announcer, Jeff Weller, and the referee, Josh Rosenthal, they later took Fed time on a $6 million weed bust. So there's, like, so much happening at that event. Like, if you're going to do an MMA documentary about a historic event, <laughs> the, that IFC tournament, in my opinion, like, should be in the top three. I agree with you. It was a great one. And it was a typical long car. Like anytime a promoter comes in, he doesn't know what he's doing. He tries to sell a bunch of tickets by putting a bunch of locals. So it was like a 22 fight card. Uh, I mean, Ron Herman fought on there because he did time in Colorado. Nate Marquardt was on there because he lived in Colorado, but it just kept going. It was like the never ending event where you go, man, we got to get out of here. So it was like a six hour show. It was too much. And if you look at the fighters that pulled out of the tournament, Paulo Filo, a future opponent of yours, Mike Van Arsdale and Nico Vitale. All those guys pulled off. So had all of the tournament came together, it would have just been mind-blowing. Sure. Um, all right, so we had already talked about your Gladiator Challenge fight. On December 13, 2003, Full Contact Fight Federation, which you, I believe you're the promoter of, and you fought. And you kind of get your first taste. It's, it's what I consider your first promo. It's like you did your first heel turn with uh, your little pro wrestling kind of gimmick um, against... Greg Cronut, who is a former state champion wrestler, and I think he was self-trained at that time. How did that fight come together? So, uh, yes, I was the promoter of that, and we weren't a main event. I want to say we're their number nine fight out of 12, but we had a sold-out place, and we had a television deal out here. Now, it was public service, so it was, it was free. We gave it to them, but they aired it on the public side. Same channel that airs Mr. Rogers, by example, for a period of time, <laughs> was airing Chael's Cage fights that I would go drop off the uh, you know the the programming too so it was a big deal though a lot of people watched it people looked for it and we could sell out uh, arenas we did it once a month 1068 was capacity but we had capacity each time so and yes we brought in that extra element where we would do uh, interviews you know as you said promo hang screens in the arena so it would play everybody would get fired up and i think that's what you're referring to but great yes. took that match and he was a state champion that's right from washington state he drove in for it and uh, I've never seen Greg since. He was a perfectly nice guy. We had our match. and I, But I don't know if he was an MMA guy. I think that might have been the only match he did. Yeah, he called you out. It was uh, – you called out the bad guy. And it was real interesting. You, you do your promo where it's – you list two things that would offend you. If Of the three, which didn't exist, it was, it was good. It was kind of <laughs> um, a glimmer into what you would become later on, which you know, honestly made you a household name. Um, Miguel, he gets on your radar for MFC Euphoria, March 13, 2004. So, Miguel, you were doing these Euphoria events. You had uh, backers. What put Chell on your radar? Well, I, I, and I wanted to ask Chell. Chell, you know, I, you mentioned Matt Lindland. You mentioned Randy Couture. The guys you, you roll with, you know. Then you add to that Liebing. You add to that Nate Markhart. Did you ever get the, was that like, until you got on your own, you seem to cut loose because you always kind of seem to play second fiddle and keep quiet behind those guys. So that's part of the story for me is they had Lindland and other people in the UFC. And I think I had a UFC level guy here who wasn't going to get into the big show right now. You know, Miguel, I had a hard time. Those guys, those guys are my idols. I looked up to those guys and still to this day, there is a part of it where I never understood at that time, or even now, they would not make a phone call on my behalf. You know, every every organization out there, every team out there that had anybody that had a level of clout, it didn't matter if you were in Pride or the UFC, but they could make a phone call. Hey, Dana, yeah. I need this guy. This is my guy. And then you'd have teams go into these things. You have three, four guys training for the same goal or on the same cards. And we had Randy, who was the champion. We did not have one guy on our gym. We had Team Quest at the time. We were amongst the three. We might have been number one, but we were amongst the top three biggest gyms in the country. We had Randy as champion. <clears throat> Nobody else was even signed. Not one guy. Then Dan Henderson was in Japan, I believe a champion. I know he had some belt, but they did Grand Prix and stuff. 
Not one other <laughs> guy was signed. And I would talk to those guys as nicely as I could. I would tell them what I just said. I go, guys, every team has multiple guys, you, but we have nobody. Have you not asked? Have you not asked? And they would say, well, you know, come to practice or keep training. Like they said, these. and I, for years, I did it for years. And there was finally, I got Joe Silva's email from somebody somewhere. I got it. I sent Joe Silva an email that night. I was in the UFC. I sent him an email at like 10 or 11 in the morning that night. I had a contract that was signed and executed and I was in the UFC and all wow. I, every day I would ask those guys, please, could you, could you send a text? Hey, what about this? Hey, I'll take on Phil Baroni was a big deal in the UFC at a time. And I had a past with Phil Baroni and I was trying to tell these guys the story. And I think that this is marketable. They wouldn't even send the text. They wouldn't even Man. send it, wrote them out for them and said, send it to them. And they, you know, like their wives would respond to their emails. They wouldn't even get back to me. And I thought these guys were my friends. I mean, I looked up to these guys. <laughs> I sent one email on my own. I got in, paid them 20% for the rest of my career. Wow. I'm wow. probably not doing that. You're a nicer guy than I am. I'm like, <laughs> I'm probably not doing it. <laughs> So, so it's a tough one. It's, it's I try to not remember the story the way that it really happened. I try I kind of change it in my own mind so that I could, but yeah, and it so was a deal just, with it. He had a room full of guys. They didn't get any of them in. Yeah, it's hard so, to believe, man. I, I don't get it. So, Chael, your your fight against uh, Armin Gambirian was that your first fight at 185? That's a good. I don't know. I thought Mayhem Miller was at 185, but I suppose I can't remember. But I remember it was Gambirian. over 200. Yeah, Gambarian was 85, and that was uh, that was with Miguel. We were, that was the Taj Mahal as well. Russia had brought out a team. You know, the Russians are so tough, and at that time, they weren't all that good. And I don't mean that as a slide. Like, they weren't that good. They were just tough. They were typical tough. Russians. Right. They're, they're really good athletes. We're still trying to win the, the, excuse me, the world and Olympic medals at that point. Now Russia as a country has got very behind MMA, but at that time, they would just send over these really tough guys, but not necessarily skilled. And I think maybe that's where Gambaran fit. I can't recall. Uh, I can't recall the weight class. I remember the food that Miguel had us all eating was amazing that week. So if I was eating that <laughs> there much, you go, yeah, it was either easy, easy to make the weight or was it two hundred five? I can't remember. So you, you had Dan Henderson in your corner, and I think he was in Temecula at that time. Did you do your camp with Dan? No, I did all of mine at home and in Portland. I've never left uh, Portland for a training camp. We had lots of guys that came in, including Dan. When Dan had a fight coming up, he would leave and come in to uh, to Oregon. But no, I went to uh, Team Quest every day, e even till my career ended two years ago. And uh, it wasn't called Team Quest anymore. It was called ATT, but it was the same guys. The same guys left or went over here. We had a new facility. But it's, I've been with the same group from day one. Okay. Hey, so another corner man you had there uh, was a guy I bring up on this podcast out of respect, too. And uh, maybe we could get uh, your memories on Robert Follis. Yes. Oh, what a great coach, Miguel. You know, I mean, Robert was a really great guy, but he was such a coach because he was such a student. I used to go to seminars like Eddie Bravo came through one time. So I pop into the Eddie Bravo seminar and I get there and Robert is either on the mat or at other seminars I had went to. He's already there and he had a notepad and he would be taking notes. He'd be watching somebody and taking notes and he never quit learning. And a lot of athletes do that. It's the beginning of the end of their career. But a lot of coaches do that very early on. Hey, I got everything. I got this figured out. I've done it for a decade. Robert was never that way. Um, even when he had his black belt, he was never that way. He was going into seminars. He was learning lessons. He was talking with people. When he got a little older, he wasn't on the mat. You know, his workout clothes as often, but he was in just as many <laughs> workouts. And he was asking just as many questions. He was watching just as many YouTube videos. And I mean, he was just a real student. And then he started to really motivate people on a human level. Like a lot of guys admired him and Robert became more of a life coach. And I mean, that, that was a big blow when Robert left Oregon just to go to uh, Nevada. It, it affected a lot of people. They, you know, he they looked at him like a father at that point. And then, you know, as you said, rest his soul. When he passed, uh, some people have not fully recovered yet. You know, Robert, Robert meant a lot more to a lot more people than he knew. That's for sure. So, Chael, when we when Chris and I we're like boxing fanatics. So when we run into like these high end amateur boxers that have fought all over the world and are now pros, the first thing Chris and I usually ask is, "Did you fight a Cuban? Did you beat a Cuban?" Because that is a benchmark that is very high on the amateur circuit. How had, is this the first Russian that you had beat, whether in competition 
with wrestling or MMA or had you had others? Because that's the wrestling benchmark. I, I agree with you on that. Uh, that was the first Russian I beat. It wasn't the first I tried to beat. I competed with okay. Russian before, but I had never beaten a Russian. The closest I came, I was at a tournament in France and I lost two to nothing in a Greco-Roman match. But even being that close, I mean, that was as close as I got. I bragged about it. I lost to the Russian, but only by two. <laughs> and a lot of people told me good job. I mean, they knew what that meant. They're like, wow, good. it must have been a good match. I'm like, yeah, it was a good match. So They're tough, man. They're tough athletes. Look, I predicted this in 2012 when the UFC started signing Russians. I was telling those guys, don't sign them unless you plan to be in business with Russia. Because when the Russia invasion comes, it's going to be like nothing you've seen. There's a different level of discipline there. I mean, you're, you're talking about guys that have never had a sip of alcohol in their life and every day they're training. It's sure. yeah, no, it's, it's bonkers. So it's a big part of it. I mean, they'll, they'll take you out of home. If they identify you as a good athlete, they'll take you out of home and they'll put you in, in certain buildings. I have, I visited and trained there, but like in the, in one of the buildings I was at that I trained at, they live on one floor. They socialize like there's a TV and computers on this floor. They take all their schooling here. They eat down here and they train down here. They never leave that building. It's built into floors. Here we, we sleep in it. And it goes through. Not to mention, I mean, nobody ever wants to tell the truth about Russians, but they are way ahead of everybody in the world of steroids. That is government. For sure. It starts very young. They'll grab kids. They'll change their passports and lie about their age. There, there's youth wrestling called <laughs> You got to be 15 or 16, right? They'll enter an 18 year old, give him a fake passport and juice him out of his mind just to go win <laughs> one of these little medals. We got the cadet world championships going right now. Literally right now they're happening. We got an Oregon boy in the finals, but those Russians, I mean, they're not 15 and six, they're lying They're And the government helps them and they're freaking yoked. And that's the real truth on Russian sports, man. They're really good at cheating. It, it's well, kind of like a Dominican little league world series team sure. they're not even allowed yeah, excellent or, 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 right. what, or everything you said also from the building for the training to the you know poverty in the area and stuff but to the focus also applies <clears throat> to cuban boxing you yep. know cuban boxing for sure so, so chael we have kind of we visited a top this topic with the other people involved that also pertains to yourself Sometimes when there's a trilogy that happens, you get one guy that wins one fight, you get another guy that, that wins. Once you get, when there's a trilogy that happens, you get one guy that wins one fight, another guy that wins the other. And the third just kind of settles everything. You're involved in a trilogy where you've lost three different ways against Jeremy Horn. How does that come together? Like out of all the fights that could be matched up, you would think, oh, this has got to be settled. Like a last third Jeremy Horn fight, you know, it wouldn't take place. Well, he it probably would have for a little bit longer. There, there. After Jeremy and I got done, there was probably another at least two years that if we would have fought two more times or five more times, he would have still won them all. And he had a thing over me. I mean, he was just like, he really understood the sport. And I could get position on him. Even those fights, I lost him. I was pounding him. You know, one of them, we were in the second or third round. I'd won both rounds, clearly, on all the judges. I was dominating the fights. <laughs> but he'd have a trick her there. And I could never be at ease with Jeremy. There was never a point, no matter how bad I was pounding him, that I could exhale. I knew he's still got an arm bar coming. He's still going to try this guillotine. He was real slick with the elbows. Like before Tony Ferguson was cutting people over, Jeremy Horn was cutting people open with elbows. He, he was, he was very tricky. He had a lot of experience. He wouldn't work out as much as I would, but so there were some weekends where he fought twice. He fought on a Friday and he'd get in the car and, and then he'd fight on a Saturday. You know, he had like a couple hundred fights. Right. But Chris, this is real. He did that. And, you know, before it was commissions, they would book him. And Jeremy was actually ranked number one in the world. Anderson was ranked number two. They fought. Anderson beat him. But that's how Anderson became number one. He beat Jeremy in a sideshow. It wasn't even in the UFC, but these guys were so respected on the regional scene. And that's where I was running into Jeremy. Like I could get him down and I could pound him pretty good. I could win. But Hanging in there for 15 minutes at that point in my career was hard. I actually went to a hypnotist, a hypnotist after the third time I lost to Jeremy. And I told the guy, I said, Hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. I guess I'm just hoping because I'm desperate, but I got this guy. I beat the hell out of him. I've never lost a round to him and I've never won a fight against him. Something's going on. And I got hypnotized. And that's when I went on my run. My next loss wasn't really. I ran into Anderson and lost for the championship. Yeah. And I don't know, that could have been a coincidence, by the way, but maybe not. Maybe there was something to that. I, I don't know. That's what happened, though. Okay. So, Chael, Chael, like, on a regional scene, like, 
Miguel and I, we're, we're in communication a lot in regards to like the upswing on certain fighters. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty involved in the Chicagoland area. And you come out December 3rd, 2004. And I know you, you've talked about this before, but I think I got a little different angle on it. I was a judge for your fight against Terry Martin in the XFO. Do you recall? I mean, you, you obviously recall the fight. Did you break your rib in between rounds in, in round two in that yeah. bout? Well, and I still got it. I still got the rib out of place. So uh, there was a time in my career where I denied every loss I had. And it wasn't just publicly. <laughs> I mean, even in, in my own heart and mind, I denied it. I lost to John Jones and I lost to Terry Martin. And um, I mean, it was tough, but it was a reality. You know, when I was getting my confidence or the night before a fight or you're building into something, you know, you got to believe in something. But I did dominated and beat every even the guys who got their hands raised against me i controlled them i won every round blah 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 except against jones and except against martin martin was just a really hard fight and i told robert in between that fight i told him what happened my ribs out and if you hurt a rib it's a different level of pain i haven't dealt with a lot of injury in my life i've dealt with a lot of pain but not i never had like the acl and some of the what conor mcgregor's going through i got lucky i just did it a broken knuckle a broken nose here or there that hurt so bad and I know what it's like, right? I know what it's like if you quit in between rounds. It's it's a different level of losing with the boys. Like, not with the community or the betters, but with the boys <laughs> in the locker room. That's a dip, right, Chris? But we don't oh, yeah. quit in between. You can't quit on a break. Don't you go out on the stool, man. You can't yeah. quit on a water break. Yeah. So I was telling Robert, you know, I was trying to talk to him, and I couldn't really talk. Yeah, had no oxygen wasn't coming through. And I was trying to tell Robert what happened. Now, what I'm hoping is that he stops the fight. <laughs> I don't want to say stop the fight. I can't go on, but I'm handing him all of the clues and he is not picking up on it. And he's like, oh, well, there's only you've done it for 10 minutes. You could deal with it another five. I'm like, all right, I'm no. Like, yeah. And I'm trying to let him know. And he finally says to me flat out, do you want me to stop this fight? And I don't know if I nodded or if I said the word, but somewhere I said yes. And I did. I did. For sure, I wanted to stop the fight. I could. I, I'm a tough guy. I wasn't tough enough to deal with that. And uh, But it always – Robert, you should have got me out of that fight. What do you think I'm telling you I can't breathe for just for the sake? Get me out of here, man. I got I to gotta get to a hospital. My rib was <laughs> out. It was sticking all out of play. Like, come on. We're done. He, he beat me. We're done. So the, the one thing that – I really enjoyed about this bout was like, so Terry Martin is seven and zero on the regional scene and you're 12, five and one, you've got the team quest pedigree. You know, we've, we've talked about your, your predecessors and, and instructors, you know, from your gym. So Terry, nobody locally wants to fight Terry and nobody also wants to buy a ticket from Terry to watch him fight. So what Terry does is he gets so amped up. They announced Terry first. No, no. They announced you first. They announced Terry second. And Terry goes and does like almost like a face off with you before the fight even starts. But what, Chael, what you don't see is every time Terry fights after this, he is so emotionally just ravaged because he just wants to kill somebody. He gets his hand raised in the cage and runs to the bathroom where he breaks down and just screams at the top of his lungs, crying. Oh, and then he goes out and people are like, no, nah, man, I, I, I'll, I'll come and see you here. But, you know, I, I don't want to deal with you to buy a ticket from you. And he I had to, like, tell him, you know, it's not a real good sales point, Terry, to, sure. you know, be so <laughs> destructive after you just won in order to get fans. Well, so was it, it, was, it was fun watching that fight take place. And I had a feeling you had an issue in the second round. So Terry was a gangster of some level, whether he wanted to be or was in his neighborhood. No, no, he was legit. Yeah, he Legit. did his shirt off, and he had he had bullet GD. holes through his body. But Terry <laughs> yeah, yeah. grew up to be a great guy. Like he went and not only got his degree, he went back and got a master's degree. I don't know if you're aware really? of that, where Terry is now. But Terry the boy, maybe not so good. Terry the man, I think he's a pretty solid guy. Yeah, his son is uh, got a lot of upside too. His son just started fighting. He's he's got he's he's got some traction. So at this point, Shale, you're in your career. You're actually one in four in your last five fights. Mentally speaking, how close were you to just saying, maybe this isn't for me? 
I never knew I was one and four. I will tell you though, there was one, the one time I broke where I was done, I had fought, uh, it was my second time getting to go back to Pancrase and I fought a gentleman and his, his record wasn't overly skilled. And I had watched a bunch of tapes the night before and it was guys finishing fights. And, and again, you have to understand, uh, excuse making, but to understand the story, we didn't spar back then. So you really did have to get in the ring on the few chances you could try and then, and try to put it all together. So I was watching these tapes in the, in the Tokyo hotel room of guys finishing fights. And I realized, okay, get on top and go, go all out. So the fight starts and I throw them down and I go all out and the ref doesn't stop it. So <laughs> I got, there's nothing left. I'm done. I'm all done. And I hang in there for the next 13 minutes of, of misery and they ended up raising his hand. And it was controversial. A lot of people thought I should have won because they did it like pride rules where it was one long fight, even though there was three rounds. And yeah. I was so dominant for those two minutes. And, and he wasn't overly dominant, but I offered no offense. And that's really all I remember is, is checking out early, hanging in, and just waiting for the bell to ring. And I was completely at peace when they rose his hand. It didn't upset me. It didn't bother me because I, I knew the I'm done. I walked right in the hallway. I sat down and I retired from the sport right there. And that was around 2003 off the wow. top of my head, but yes. And I was so at, at that point, Miguel and I are having conversations about yourself and Miguel tells me because I, you know, I don't have access to pancreas fights and Miguel has got a video collection. That's incredible. And the one thing Miguel said to me is Sonin doesn't travel well. And he <laughs> referenced both of your fights in Japan. And yeah. it was also foretelling when you fought Damien Maia in, in London. It's just you hit cardio walls. Maybe you weren't out there early enough. It was the environment. But he said you didn't travel well. And Yamamiya in that fight in Pancras, outside of him also pretending you kicked him in a groin, I slowed it down. It was an inside leg kick. He also got a point taken away uh, from yourself with that. Oh, I lost a point there. too. All right. Well, yes. and that's how much I, I really recall about that. He um, yeah. I was a favorite going into that. Like I said, his, his record wasn't all that beautiful, but uh, he won that fight. I mean, like, I, no, I stopped two minutes in. I was, I was checked out. I still remember, Chris, have you ever been that tired? I still remember how exhausted I was. This is 20 years ago. I remember how tired I was. Yeah, I remember having a fight in WEC, and they changed opponents a couple of times and everything. And I remember going out after the second round, I, I had put this guy in like 10 submissions, and I know I never finished him. Uh, he's a tough guy, uh, Pat Healy. I remember going into the third round, I told my corner, I was like, I, I can't lift my arms. And they're just like, you got to go out there. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, man. And, and it's it's the longest five minutes of my life. I remember at one point I'm, I'm pushing him against the fence and I look up and I'm like, please be almost over. And it was like 354, 353. I'm like, God, no. You know what I mean? It's just like, how's it been one minute? I mean, there's no worse feeling in the world that being that dead. I've never had anything. I mean, it's it's beyond describable. You can't do it. So, Chris, by the way, small world, Pat Healy is my neighbor right now to this day. I mean, he's, he's about, 20, about 20 miles away. But, yeah, he, he's got a twin brother named Ryan, by the way. Yeah. Pat, Ryan, the, the Healy, they're still in the area. Pat still coaches at Team Quest. He works with the kids. Good job. I remember. I remember. He. I was supposed to fight him last minute. Phil and I was like, "Yeah, his record's like twelve and seven. No big deal." And then I started looking into it. And I was like, "Okay, that, that guy beat him's in the UFC. That guy's in the UFC." And I said, "This guy's fought nothing but like nineteen tough guys." <laughs> I started worried about the day before. I hadn't really trained for it. It's just a last minute feeling. That guy was tough. I had him in like five different submissions. I couldn't stop him. I was were bending and everything. I was just like, "This dude's tough as nails, man." Chris, I was promoting a show, and these twin boys out of Salem, Oregon, Ryan and Pat Healy, were our stars. These guys were selling out. Small venue, but they were selling it out. Kids were coming in. I mean, they would go crazy when they'd enter the building. They were both champions. Pat beat Chris Lieben to win the championship. To put in perspective how tough he is. Yeah, a lot of people don't wow. know that. I got I a phone know call one day from a woman who identifies herself as Mrs. Healy, and she informs me that her twin sons – are minors. And I said, <laughs> that cannot be true. They are the champion of the promotion and you must be 18 to enter. And she said, <laughs> they lied. They are juniors in high school. Oh, so, wow. Pat Healy lied about his age and beat Chris Levin as a junior in high school. Ryan Healy lied about his age and beat Brad, uh, bad Brad Blackburn, who went on to yeah. win his first three fights in the UFC and at I least came with the bonus. So when you look at their record and talk about how deceptive it is, 
they were like, they were like, uh, who was that? Hands of stone. Duran. Duran used yeah. to have yeah. about his age to earn money. The Healy boys were lying and fighting grown men, and they were beating most of them. Well, it worked because I didn't. I, I mean, just seeing him, I was like, eh, whatever. And then he gave me. All, I want to split the decision. It's the only split the since I've ever won in my career was against him because I offered nothing in that last round. I I laid on bottom. I got lucky actually. He uh. At one point, he's pouring blood. I, I thought he cut me open, so I'm holding my head so they don't stop it because I feel like I won the first two rounds. And I finally look up, and it's him bleeding on me. I don't know how we got cut open because I was on bottom, but I was like, thank God they're not going to stop it. But uh, I think his head hit the fence or something, but I, I got lucky on that one because I had nothing to offer that last round. It was horrible, man. Only t I got done with the match. I went and sat by the fence for about 15 minutes. I couldn't move. I remember that fight. I remember that fight very well. Yeah. Those really? boys are tough, man. Those Healy boys are tough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so let me throw in a quick caveat about Pank Race. Chris, your first loss was against Jason DeLucia, correct? DeLuca? You, I didn't lose that fight, but yeah. Okay. So Jason DeLuca, the early UFC fame, he speaks fluent Japanese. So they would bring him in. He's a guy from Boston where 95% of his fights are in Japan. He's only fought at home once, maybe twice. And they would bring him to Japan because he would spy on the Americans and tell the Japanese what they're working on, what they're expecting. So he would just kind of, Gary Myers broke it down to us. We just had Gary on the other day and he's like, no, DeLuca was a spy. DeLucia was a spy. He used to tell on everybody going over there, which is why he kept getting invited back. Miguel, MFC Euphoria. This is pre Dog. You're getting there. You're looking at a guy that's one in four in his last five fights. Bill Mahood falls off the card. Chell comes in and fights Adam Ryan or Adam Lynn, uh, at, who's 4-0 as a last-minute replacement. Was Chell just kind of on your short list at this point, or was that your intention to have him on the card prior to that? Well, if he was one of – the Glenbarian win was under my flag, right? So right. that had already happened. And, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, and some people have criticized Chell throughout his career or at some point in his career about maybe – a boring style or whatever. I thought he had a great fight and he actually fought all his fights for me were great fights. So, you know, Gambarian is a tough guy to win. How can you not have him back? Joe, did, how, how far out did you take that fight? Well, so in his, by the way, he's changed his last name. I knew him as Adam Tarsi, by the way, but I've right. heard that he's now Adam Lynn. And so hello to Adam, but, uh, I can't remember how short that fight was. I remember tr trying to get on and Miguel was looking at me, but Miguel was also interested in Matt Horwich. And we were the same gym at the same weight class. And I don't know how well Miguel remembers this, but uh, it was one of those things where, and some, I was kind of competing with my own teammate to get this contract and to get this opportunity. Um, but I, I ended up with it, you know, then Miguel goes over to Bowden. I owe Miguel a lot. Miguel, I've been wanting to thank you for years, and I, and I haven't ran into you. I even wrote you at your old email, and it bounced back to me. But I have tried to find you and thank you. I have not forgotten that you gave me my break, brother, just so you know. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and and it, it was a situation where that now he's 2-0. and oh, He's been on my roster. He's probably been fighting for 2000, 2000, right? So now here comes the move. You have Bodog backing, and... I did give Chael a contract that I think made a difference, you know, and it was, it was four fights, $25,000 a fight, four fights in 18 months, you know? So now, Good. He's, making, Jeez. now he's making about 75,000, $70,000 a year on salaries. It's still not great, but it's closer to being able to live on it. And I think if you look at the four fights that Chael put in there, that it showed because he came in a murder. He came in an absolute murder for all those fights motivated at, at a high level still not talking for me though still not, not giving us the mic work but that's okay but I, I think that's what you had and then i always felt at the end since we're it's confession time i always felt yeah i had trevor with the belt and i didn't want to do you and trevor again just because you know i thought you were younger and you could get your chance later sure and I, th I thought you might fight the winner of him in condo and then what actually happened in the bodog world was Something that I felt may have happened to you before was Lindlin got the contract to fight Fedor, and then he's got a, a high price contract where it makes more sense to put him in the five rounder with Trevor. And you got, and it was talked about him and Trevor, him and Trevor for the belt, and you got cut off yet again. I wonder if you noticed that. 
Because I, 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 I actually did not know that. That would not surprise me. No, I didn't know that. I remember Matt versus Fedor. And I remember that his attitude did change a little bit after that. And I remember trying to patch things going, Matt, please don't make waves with these guys. Like, these are my guys. I'm, I've been over here first. You came in second. Like, don't, don't make trouble for me here. And whatever happened, you know, I, but one day I got called from Matt and he's like, Hey, you're not with them anymore, but you are fighting Paulo Filo for the WEC championship in uh, two weeks. I said, okay. <laughs> well, don't, don't you share? I, I've been meeting as are, are you still with Steven Thompson? Is that who still represents you? No, Steve, I, Steve left the fight business, uh, by the way, got in a, a personal battle with cancer that I believe he has beaten. I know that uh, I, I believe he's beaten it and that's just recent. Um, but Steve was, uh, he wanted to be an MMA manager and then, you know, whatever happened with team quest and Matt, and then Matt ended up in a lawsuit with Dan Henderson. And I don't even know if those guys talk anymore. Really? So, yeah. The rest of us, all, all of the guys, we kind of moved over and only about two or three blocks, Fabiano Scherner, a black belt at our gym that ran the jujitsu program started his own thing. And we all went with him, you know, the Healy boys and Ed Herman and the Horwich. I mean, the, the whole crew stayed together. But uh, Steve was kind of a casualty of that. Steve was Matt's guy. So when people left, you, you know, Steve and Matt kind of left together. Gotcha. So from, from there, Chael, you had mentioned you drop an email to, to Joe Silva. And that night you're in the UFC. It's up a weight class. Was that the caveat for taking your fight UFC 55 against Babalu, a rematch, I might add? All right, Miguel, you want to know what happened? Here's what happened. <laughs> I got hit on a on a ped bust in California. Now I tested positive for a legal substance. I tested positive for testosterone, which is legal in California at the time. Different jurisdictions had different rules. Some said you can use testosterone, but you must be approved. And other jurisdictions said you can use testosterone. You must disclose. So Steve, who was the manager, we did all of these things. We not only took it, we disclosed it in writing, signed and dated by the executive director. They then find me guilty of testing positive for testosterone, which would make <laughs> sense considering I was on testosterone. So when it's time to go to the hearing and explain to them their own rules, and as condescending as that sounds, it's exactly what we had to do. I had to go to a hearing, show them page three of their rule book, and Steve's got oh. it come in and defend me. You got to have a lawyer to do this. You're taking on a lawyer from the government. And Steve didn't want to fly in. He did not want to fly in and do this. And I don't find out that he doesn't have a plane ticket. I've got a hearing that my entire life hinges on. I don't find out he doesn't have a plane ticket until the day before when he calls me and says, I don't have a plane ticket. <laughs> now, I'm out of a job. I haven't worked in a period of time. So all the sponsors are gone and all the fights. I mean, this is a really hard thing. And I, and so I said to him on the phone, I said, Steve, well, I can pay you as soon as I fight again. And I oh, remember yeah. what he said, he pauses and he goes, well, yeah, but when will that be? That's a quote. <laughs> oh, and I remember man. My own manager, right? This is my own guy that was supposed to have the paperwork in line that now doesn't have a plane ticket to define me, defend me in a trial. That's tomorrow. He's leaving Chicago, the busiest airport in the country, flying into LAX, the second biggest. <laughs> busiest airport. And he says to me, he goes, well, call Dana and tell him I need a ride. Tell him I'll defend his guy, but he needs to pay for my travel. And I remember thinking, Steve, you're my manager. I don't call Dana to get you anything. You call Dana to get me things. And um, I I'm said, okay. Not... Like I needed to stay real calm. I got to, you know, I got to be front and center, sworn in under oath tomorrow. And so I said, okay. And so I got, I got it together, and I got him his plane ticket. And uh, but I mean, that, that's what happened. And, and Jail, I mean, like it, and they tried to reword it. I, I don't know why they do. I've never thrown them under the bus, and I'm not now. That's what Jail, happened. But you can't I manage. Got, I got some bad news for you. Um, <laughs> these people aren't your friends. No. I mean, everybody you're talking to about me, I, I, they're like enemies. To, I don't. I can't believe this. People aren't getting you fights. People. Are, I mean, Jesus, man, you're dealing with a lot of adversity. I, I think you're a nice guy. You've always been great to me. I don't know who people are doing to you, but you're being mistreated, in my opinion. I, I mean, I, I would consider these people that. not yeah. friends. I'm just not kidding. Hey, man, uh, come hang out with me. I'll treat you too, good, buddy. Yes, when I, when I look back, yeah, no, it was it was pretty bad. It yeah. was pretty bad. And now let me have one more quick Team Quest question. And one of the problems I think you ran into 
was that with Henderson, Linlin, then, you know, later on, maybe Nate Quarry. And, you know, there were so many guys in your weight class. But uh, one of the guys from back then that's got a legendary reputation, didn't really fight, was a guy named Rico Ciparelli. What, nope. what, what do you think? What, tell me what you saw, what, what, what he's really like on the mat, like a go core of wrestling or like, a, you know, like one of those legendary guys. Is, is, it, is it for real? Yes, yes. R- Rico was very special, but he was also unique. He was wiry. He had a flexibility. Now, he started to learn jujitsu when the rest of us couldn't spell it quite literally. And there was a time when jujitsu was like hyphenated and then there was a capital. J- like literally, we couldn't spell jujitsu and he was learning it. And he had a brown belt. He was a multiple wow. time NCAA champion under Dan Gable. He was one of the guys. He never made the World or Olympic team, but he was right there in the final wrestle off. So he was special and he secretly learned this thing called jujitsu. So, yes, to see Rico on the mat for a period of time, 98 to 2000, was very special. Now, why he never competed, what he didn't believe in, in himself or, or, you know, where, what fears he had. I, I don't really know. You'll, you'll hear those stories of those practice room guys. I mean, I'll swear up and down on, on Dennis Hallman to see Dennis Hallman in the practice room is uh, not quite the Dennis you saw on television. That Dennis was good too, but Dennis in the practice room, and I'm sure Chris has plenty of his practice, room, but that's a real thing. Some guys get uh, competitive anxiety. They just, you know, they shut down other guys. They don't, but uh, yes, Rico was special. That is true, Miguel. Yes. All right, so we're going through your career. I'm going to interject with kind of an, an off-topic question. So Ultimate Fighter 1 happens. It's a huge success. The company is has got momentum. A lot of different eyes are on it. Ultimate Fighter 2 tryouts are happening. And, you know, Team Quest has kind of got, you know, you got Randy Couture. You've got Matt Lindland. And Couture's, the real estate that Couture had with the UFC was very large. And... You guys had, I believe, Ryan Schultz that was trying out for the Ultimate Fighter at that time. Why Why did he not make the show? I mean, there was a little bit of, like, kind of rumor that I had heard, but... Yep. And, and Mike, will you forgive me? I know this is... I have a call with our friend Anthony in two minutes, but, but can I... T- at four o'clock, but let me tell you, so Ryan Schultz was a killer, and he even became... The IFL, if you guys remember, International Fight League, but he was their champion. He made famous something called a Schultzy handshake. He took on a, a guy named Chris Horndetsky, who was like yes. 19 but undefeated. And Schultz reached around his back, trapped the hand, patted him out, and won the belt. Schultz was incredible. He ended up with uh, jaw issues, chin issues, where if you touched him, he would go to sleep. He just played ah. a really rough style. He looked great when it worked, but it shortened his career. He went into coaching. He's got his own gym in Colorado. He's got a bunch of up and comers. So he's still involved in the sport and is a, a major success. But as far as his time in the spotlight, he never got worse. Like he never quit training or got distracted and started partying. He did everything right. He just ran into that chin issue. That's uh, mm. you know a lot of guys. It happens to them. It happened to him. Okay, so Chris, you I've, I said you got to get going. Let's all right. Anderson Silva. After your fight with Anderson Silva, he had a barbecue. Did you go to that, or is that just a rumor? Purely a rumor. He invited me. I never thought it was serious, and they hated me in Brazil. Like, I, I, <laughs> I was not going to go. I did not. In fact, I did the Ultimate Fighter there two years later and had a three-man armed security detail, and we rode around in a bulletproof car. Like, it was <laughs> Brazil and I worked everything else out now, but at uh, one point in time, those guys could not take a joke, all right? Uh, <laughs> all right, last one. You had a run in with Crow Cop in an elevator. Yes. Would you disclose what took place? Okay. So, and I kept and this secret done. for a long time, but then I, I visited with Crow Cop. Turns out he's a really great guy, which I didn't know. I was with my girlfriend. Okay. No, that's not true. Crow Cop was in the elevator with a buddy and my girlfriend. So they said something in Croatian. The door opened, which was her floor. She got off and they started laughing. I have no way to know if they were laughing at her or not. She <laughs> thought that they were. Never liked him, tried to fight him since. Now, I met him two years ago at the Mohegan Sun. Couldn't get along any better. Misunderstanding by me and Crow Cop. That's it. All right. Well, you had mentioned you got a phone call. Hey, hey well, thank yeah, you, guys. Can- I miss you all. Thank you for letting me come on. Thanks, fellas. Yeah, thank you. Man. Thank, you, to thank you, you so much for your time. I know you got tons going on. Wow. What a great. 
interview we had there with Chael Sonnen, um, phenomenal. That's why that guy is um, bad gank, whatever. He's one of the greatest, uh, talking his way into everything. They got some great stories. So if you guys enjoy it, please like, uh, subscribe, uh, share, whatever you got to do to help us out because we want to keep throwing stuff like this out there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it was nice to catch up with Chael. I, you know, it's the kind of thing where when, when a guy goes out and becomes a big star like that, you never know if you're going to cross paths with him again or, you know, if I'm ever going to see him. You know, Chris, obviously, more likely than me, you know. And uh, But he, he I, I think you remembered, you know, that we we worked together for a long time. I think he was grateful. I think we got him for a long time, Mike. I think that was a big victory, right? I so, told you, I said, just keep asking questions, dude. Just let him make the call. <laughs> so... We hooked this up through Diamond Sportsbook, uh, betdsi.eu. Anthony, that's my guy. Took care of us on this. Anthony also told us we got him for an hour. So when I explained this to Chris and Miguel, yeah, they were like, yeah, yeah. Um, you're just going to keep going until he makes up an excuse to get, to get out of the interview with us. So I was like in my head thinking, Okay, so three pages of my notes generally equal about 75 minutes. So we kind of flew through some of it, but I got, I got about five pages of notes, so I knew where we were, like, way past the hour. So I was thinking, I have six more pages of notes. Like, there's, there's no – we're going to be here for five hours if I continue going down the road. I went down, and I'm like – He's going to have to either – I thought he was going to fake a bathroom break and then just kind of, like, turn it off and, and leave. But I believe he he pretended to have a phone meeting with Anthony, who I corroborated with after I said, yeah, Anthony, I said he had to talk to you. And he's like, no, he didn't. I'm like, okay, that makes me feel good. You know, like, we got, we got him, like, 30 minutes over over the t a lot of time that we're supposed to have before. <laughs> Yeah, I hey. think that I think that's a good victory, but I think you got to keep in mind here, like you know, we end the podcast like, all right, guys, you know, see you later, thanks, you know. But this guy, he had his out. That shit was scripted, planned. He knew if this goes long, I'm gonna do this because you get a phone it, get a prop, you got the pro, you got the pro out with him, man. He's out yeah. of there. He's yeah. too busy. He's too busy. Well, hey. we won. That's a that's a W, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we got him on there. We got him to talk about a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah, I was, I was surprised by a lot of it. Some of the things I was like, wow, really? Um, that was, it was kind of, uh, I thought people were taking care of him a little better than that. And uh, that, that was interesting. We didn't even get to later part. That we'll save that for the next time. Next time. Well, we'll here. In time, Anthony's going to owe me another favor and I'm going to collect on shell again because <laughs> we got, we got through the indie scene and, you know, Chael obviously is a person that makes a living telling stories. And if the stories are about himself, it's easier to do than if they're about somebody else because he's already got the information. And if you look the way we went down his career, there were several instances where he completely had forgotten about the information that was yep. posed to him in regards to it. So, I mean, here, Dan Severn stole $20 from him. The IFC was a, like a, a shit show. Uh, Gladiator Challenge owes him a belt. The <laughs> lawyer who we had thought was doing such a great job for him actually didn't Wouldn't really give a shit about him. He's like, yeah, I'll pay. And then, he said to him, I'll pay you next time I fight. And his, his when? manager said to him, well, when's that going to be? <laughs> and then... The people I, I felt fights. bad. I had to explain to him, these guys do not like you. They're not your friends. I don't know yeah. what he thought this whole time. I had to tell him. I feel bad for that. <laughs> yeah, and then him fighting uh, Babalu with a hole in the ring because Babalu yeah. went through the hole. Like, these are things that are not coming up on his own channel. And <laughs> it's also like when you listen to the other interviews that we do, like through the podcast, it's the one thing we can consistently do. Like, we get the guy greased up. We get the information. Chris has got a real good back and forth. And then we hit him with something that stings. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's, yeah. So I do, I do like how they said, they just said, uh, don't go over that side of the ring. That was there how they handled that. Yeah. So, uh -huh. um, all right. Go so ahead. I've got a list of eight questions that Chael has never answered ever. And 
they're obscure, kind of like um, the Crow Cop question. Uh, Manchi and Carlo, he's got, guy's been with me for years. That was his. He gave me that one. So I've got seven more that I want to get to that he's never answered. And once we get him greased again, I think I, think I would have pulled him out a little sooner. But that indie grind in regards to, like, documenting history, it's, oh, man, it's super important to me as well as it is all of us, I should say. Mm-hmm. So you got the, I, you got the relationship. You got the relationship developed now. It'll, it'll come easier. Just real quick before um, get a chance for anything else. Uh, what a great guy! Actually, a lot of people don't realize if you just look at his persona or whatever, a little different. Um, I will say I talked to somebody who's not. You know, I think Chael feels like, as rightly so, he wasn't taken care of as properly as he should have been, and I can say he's definitely not like that. I've talked to. I'm not going to say who, but they've said that you know. You know, they've got done training, went in their bag, and sales put a substantial amount of money in there, not wanting anything for it, just to help them out, man. Uh, what a good guy, man. Who does stuff like that? Nobody. And, 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 you know, I think one of the shocking things in the interview is the people picking up the phone, getting people fights from the gym, didn't want to do it for them. Like, they didn't. That's what really I mean. Respect, it's like they didn't what? respect them. Hard, hard to fathom what's going on. And, and then, you know, Randy's fallout. He even said, yeah, no, we had a fallout. Randy went his way. We went our way. Like, I I never thought, here, there, he even addressed the PED stuff. There's certain things that, like, I would never address with him just out of respect because, you know, if I've got an ocean full of information that I want, I'm not going to sit here and go, okay, well, I can either run off the pier and end the interview but get what I want in this one instance. <laughs> Or yeah. I got 50 questions that I can get answers to. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go down that road being a jerk. Even though you've got the ammunition, it doesn't mean you fire it. So well, my, I, I got a ton of respect for him. A ton of respect like for him. Like you say, you, you can shear the sheep many times, but you can only skin them once. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Huh? Absolutely. So, so uh, yo, I, yo, like, yo, share, yo, subscribe, guys. We need yeah. all the help we can get. Under 200 subscribers, which is but, ridiculous. But the people that watch our stuff tend to binge on it. So it's like we get one person and they go through all of our interviews. So like in regards to the math equation that like YouTube has set forth in regards to monetization, we're like halfway to get the viewing hours and we're like 20% of the way for our subscribers. So any help we can get, really helps out if you guys know a friend or family member that would enjoy something like this man just by hitting share you're helping us out we appreciate it yep i think uh you've just seen chael sonin like you never had before i agree so, i agree we'll leave so, it at that thanks thank you thanks everyone check out the full interview on itunes spotify and all major podcast platforms